So you know what Tudor did to the vintage inspired dive watch scene? They dominated it when they launched a Black Bay 58. I think they've just done the same with a vintage inspired chronograph scene. <laughs> Welcome back to Bark and Jack, I'm Adrian, and this channel is just about drinking coffee and talking watches. Today, we're talking about Tudor's brand new Black Bay Chronos, two of them. We have a Panda and a Reverse Panda. It's been 50 years since Tudor launched their first chronograph, back in the 1970s with the Oyster Date chronograph. Of course, with Rolex being the parent company to Tudor, this is a, a direct equivalent of the Rolex Daytona. That means with these new heritage chronographs being a celebration and having a heavy nod back to that original Oyster Date chronograph, it in turn has a heavy influence from the Rolex Daytona. There are a lot of similarities to the Black Bay Chrono, but there are also a lot of differences. This is a new watch, so let's go through the specifications on it. We still have a 41 millimeter wide case, but it is thinner at 14.4 millimeters thick. We have a 50 millimeter lug to lug measurements and lugs are 22 millimeters wide. We've got a dome sapphire crystal. The crown and both the pushers are screwed down and this allows a watch to have 200 meters of water resistance. And the movement inside is the in-house caliber MT5813. The movement inside is an interesting one. Breitling and Tudor have this partnership where they share their movements. Tudor has lent Breitling or, or allowed Breitling to use its time only movement. And in return, Breitling has shared their chronograph movement with Tudor. I think this is a great way of two watch brands being able to make decent watches with having control around the movements that they use, but at the same time, being able to be highly commercial and allow that price to be brought down. But this isn't just a matter of Tudor using the Breitling B01 movement in their watch. Tudor has upgraded it. They've played around with it. For example, they've upgraded the balance spring so it uses a silicon balance spring. They also use a tungsten rotor and it's finished by Tudor. They've also increased the timing from 30 minutes up to 45 minutes. Tudor's movement has 41 joules, beats at 28,800 vibrations per hour. It's COSC certified and is accurate from minus two to plus four seconds a day. And it has a very impressive 70 hours of power reserve. There are a few subtle changes with this new version of the Black Bay Chrono, a few upgrades. The dial itself is raised within the watch. So there's less space between the dial and the Sapphire Crystal, which means the movement can be mounted higher, which results in the overall watch being thinner. It's nearly half a millimeter thinner, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is noticeable when you wear it. The dial itself has recessed subdials, which has a snailing pattern on it. And then we have the bezel, which is no longer steel. It's a black aluminum insert, still a tachymeter, but it's an insert rather than a solid bezel. All of those specs seem really quite impressive. What's more impressive is the price. Just like the Black Bay 58, you get incredible amounts of watch for the money. And that's been carried over here. This is 3,900 pounds on a bracelet or 3,600 pounds on a strap. To have a watch this good looking with this heritage and with a high performing movement for 3,400 quid, that's nuts. There's an option to get this on a leather bun strap, which I think looks absolutely amazing. But as always with most watch purchases, I always advise that people get watches on the bracelets because you might end up deciding that you want to brace it further down the line. And the price difference here is less than 300 quid, it's 240 quid to get the bracelets. So you're far better off getting this watch on a bracelet and then going over to barkandjack.shop and buying one of the NATO straps that they have over there. This is 22 millimeter wide lugs and we have some kick-ass NATO straps that would suit this thing down to the ground over at barkandjack.com. Let's talk about wearability of these things because they are quite large. This is a 41 millimeter wide watch, but chronographs always wear larger because they have the pushes and so you get this appearance of being larger, but it's actually very wearable for a 41 millimeter wide chronograph because the lug to lug is 50 millimeters. That's the same as my Seamaster and it's very wearable because the bracelet just droops straight down. The way that links attached to the watch head allows the bracelet just to wrap around your wrist as opposed to having any solid links that make the bracelet stick out. It's a chunky watch, but it doesn't protrude too far. The, the crystal is domed, but I don't feel like that adds too much height to it. I, I, I think this is a very good looking watch. Maybe I could add this to my collection. No, I'm getting the new Explorer. It is annoying that this has the rivet bracelets because they're faux rivets and it highlights. We know this is a vintage inspired watch. We know there are elements on this watch that are a nod back to 
a previous generation, therefore that is purely done for styling. But I feel like faux rivets are a bit too obviously done for styling. And that's why I don't like it because there, there, there is no purpose to it beyond looks. And personally, I don't like the look of it. This watch has screw down pushes and I love that. I, I think that they're annoying to use because if you want to use a chronograph function, you have to unscrew the screw down pusher and then you can engage the mechanism. But I just love the styling of it. It does mean, however, that if you're in a situation where you need to time something quickly, you're probably gonna miss it because it is fiddly trying to unscrew these things, especially when the watch is on your wrist. That being said, I use a stopwatch pretty much daily, and when I do so, it's never in a hurry. It's always a, a planned activity. That's why I have nice old stopwatches, like this is a military one from the 70s. I use these because that's how you make good coffee. Good coffee is all about timing. It's about timing, having a good machine, and having good coffee. Very soon I'll be able to help you out with that. But even to starting the machine up, you need to give the machine time to warm up. I allow the machine to heat up for five minutes, and then cheat for some of it. I use a ratio of one to two, which means 17 grams of coffee in, and I want to extract 34 grams of coffee out. The first timing is a five second countdown for pre-infusion, allowing water to seep into the coffee, and then I engage the full pressure. To get the best flavor of espresso, you want to get to that 34 grams, that two to one ratio, you want to get to that between 20 and 30 seconds minus that five seconds of pre-infusion. If you go over 30 seconds, then your coffee will have been over-extracted. Under 20 seconds, and then your coffee will be under-extracted. The sweet spot is 20 to 30 seconds. That's how you make espresso. That's tidy. So what do you guys think of these watches? I think the white dial, or the opaline dial, is, is my favorite one. Although they are exactly the same size, the white dial just seems to wear a little bit smaller. I think perhaps just because visually it's broken down more rather than having quite a large slab of, of blackness. So guys, I wanna hear your thoughts on these watches. Do you think that this could disrupt the vintage style chronograph market in the same way that the Black Bay 58 did with the vintage style dive market? Drop me a comment. Let me know down below what you think. Jump over to barkandjack.com, check out the accessories that we have there, but also we have a new blog and we have articles on new watches over there. If you're on Instagram, give me a follow at barkandjack. And if you're on Clubhouse, give me a follow there at barker. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.